Okay, however long it takes me to record this video, we're going to go over the most important machine learning algorithms so that you can ace your next interview. I recently finished my master's degree in machine learning, and I've had these concepts come up in interviews before, so being familiar with them is definitely essential. Failing to learn these could literally cost you hundreds of thousands of dollars. My one disclaimer is that it can't realistically cover every single technical detail you need to know, and it's going to be more of an overview. So use it as a launch pad for your studying and use the chapters in the description to skip around if you need to. Okay, now that all the NPCs have clicked off the video, let's get started. Okay, you probably already know about the two broad categories in machine learning, so let's not spend much time on that. Supervised models learn from labeled data, and unsupervised models learn from unlabeled data. If you want a more detailed review, go to this time code. Otherwise, let's move on. First up, we have KNN or K nearest neighbors. This is one of the most bonehead machine learning algorithms. It's super straightforward. Let's say we have a data set of people who have used dating apps like Tinder or Hinge, and someone new comes along and you want to figure out, okay, how many matches are they going to get? You essentially just calculate the distance between our new person that has come along using the distance formula, by the way. You'll calculate the distance between the new person and every other person in the data set. The distance will be based on the input attributes that are going to affect how many matches you get like the attractiveness of your profile photo on a scale of 1 to 10. Let's say k equals 3, then we'll look at the top 3 closest people to our new person that has come along. Simply take the average of the matches that those 3 people received, and that's going to be the model's prediction for the new person. That's it! I wasn't kidding when I said a monkey could have come up with this algorithm. But remember, choosing the right value of k is important and depends on your data set. I chose k equals 3 completely randomly here, but it will be important to choose the right value of k in the future. Okay, next up is SVMs or support vector machines. These aren't as cool as neural networks, but they're still good to know and they can come up in interviews, so make sure to understand them. First, they're used for supervised learning, and the goal is to simply find a line or plane that separates our data into different classes. But how do we actually find this line? We want to find the line that maximizes this variable called the margin. And the margin is just the distance between the line and the closest data points on either side of the line, right? The closest data points from each class. And intuitively, we don't want this line to be too close to either class, right? You want to find a sweet spot. There's just one catch. The data has to be linearly separable. And if the data isn't linearly separable, we'll use something called the kernel trick. Next up, the naive Bayes algorithm. This one's pretty straightforward, and it's another supervised learning algorithm. It uses this equation to make predictions for which group a new input variable belongs to. Classification. By the way, this equation is called Bayes theorem, so that explains where the Bayes part comes from, but what about the naive part? Well, if you Google the algorithm, you'll get something about feature independence, but let's go over an example to make that easier to understand. Let's say we're going to build an algorithm that classifies your email as spam or not spam, and let's say one of our input variables is whether or not an email contains the text lottery, that simple string, and let's say one of our other input variables is you have won, that string. Well, the naive Bayes algorithm makes a naive assumption that just because the word lottery is in the email doesn't mean that it's any more likely that you're going to find the phrase you have won in the email. But clearly this is a bad assumption. If there's some email talking about the lottery, it's probably going to use the phrase you have won somewhere in that email too. So that's why it's important to make sure your features are independent or at least as close as you can get and just be aware of the limitations of this algorithm. Okay, next up, decision trees. This is another supervised algorithm and you can use it for regression or classification. We simply ask questions to end up with this tree-like structure. The goal is to actually split up our data into different groups based on these questions, and that'll make sense soon. The nodes are actually just the questions we ask, like, is it a mammal? The edges are just the outcomes or answers to these questions, like yes or no. And when you get to a leaf, that's the final model prediction for whatever question we were trying to answer about the input variable. And and we'll clarify what that is soon. But how do we actually train the decision tree? Because we start off with a data set and an empty tree. 
we have nothing. It turns out we need to pick the best questions to ask at each node. Okay, have you ever played the game 20 questions? You want to ask questions that give you the most information. Those are the best questions. You wouldn't start off the game with your final guess. You would start off asking, is it alive? Is it a person? right? These very broad questions that can give us the most information at the start. We want to narrow down the possible set of answers based on however we're trying to classify our input, right? We want to narrow down this subspace as much as we can. And there are ways that we can quantify how good a question is, right? How much information does this question give me? Like this formula for information gain and this formula for guinea impurity. But fundamentally, here's what's going on at a high level. Training a decision tree just comes down to picking the best question at each node. And we'll keep continuing this process down the tree until we meet some sort of stopping condition like the height of the tree. So decision trees are far from perfect, but they're a pretty great start for a lot of tasks. Okay, next up is random forests. Instead of just training one decision tree, let's train a bunch of decision trees. We have our starting data set, right? Let's randomly split up this data set into a few different groups and train one decision tree on each of those groups. That comprises or makes up the random forest. Then when a new data point comes along and we want to classify that data point into some group, we'll simply pass it through all of the decision trees in our random forest and we'll have a majority vote to figure out what the actual model prediction should be. And that's just a fancy way of saying that we'll take whatever prediction was most common from all the trees in the forest and that'll be our answer. And this strategy is more generally known as ensemble learning, which is when we combine or average predictions from a bunch of machine learning models to hopefully get a more accurate prediction. Okay, we still have to talk about the k-means algorithm, but I'm getting kind of bored of these old-fashioned classical ML algorithms. So let's take a quick break to talk about neural networks and generative AI, because these still fall under machine learning. Okay, the first step to understanding generative AI is actually logistic regression. And logistic Logistic regression is actually just a quick extension of linear regression, which uses this equation right here, but then we add a sigma symbol. It's the sigmoid function whose outputs are between 0 and 1. Because the output number of the sigmoid function is between 0 and 1, we can interpret the model's output as a probability. So this is super useful when you want to build a classification model, since we can think of this probability as the chance that the input belongs to class 1 or class 2. All right, time for neural networks. These are like logistic regression models on steroids. Let's say we want to predict your win rate at the game beer pong based on three input attributes. Let's say the first input is your alcohol tolerance, so a number that shows how many beers you can take before you start slurring your words. The next input is your aim accuracy, which is pretty self-explanatory. And the third input will be your trash talking effectiveness, also on a scale of one to 10. Okay, we'll store those three inputs in the input layer. Next is the hidden layer, those four nodes in the middle, and each of those nodes is gonna use the logistic regression equation to calculate an output number. So now we've got four numbers, y1 through y4, and we finally have that one output node in the final layer, which is going to take in those four numbers, y1 through y4, and then use the logistic regression equation again. Of course, this time it's going to be adjusted to handle the fact that we have four inputs to that equation, but it's still logistic regression, and that's how we'll get the final output number. So that's why I said neural networks can be thought of as logistic regression models on steroids. And training a neural network just depends on finding the right values of the W's and B so that we can maximize the model's accuracy. But what about generative AI? So most Gen AI models are based on neural networks, the kind we just talked about. But what can really vary is the architecture and structure of this network. But here's the interesting part. Most Gen AI models are actually trained with unsupervised learning, meaning we don't need labeled data. And this might sound weird at first, but the simplest example to understand is ChatGPT. We simply feed all of the raw text from the internet into the model, and the model learns to predict more text really well. We don't have to actually label each sentence or paragraph with any additional info. That means not much data pre-processing is necessary to train a 
giant large language model. It's a miracle that this even works. Okay, one more classical ML algorithm and then we'll be finished. It's the k-means algorithm. Okay, let's say we have a data set that has no labels, so you should be thinking of unsupervised learning. And let's say we want to split up our data into different clusters so that we can later do some further analysis on each cluster. Of course, it's easy to just visualize the different groups or clusters in this example since it's two-dimensional. But when dealing with much higher dimensional data, we won't really be able to visualize this, so we need a more efficient way of separating our data into groups. But for now, let's just step through an example that's got simple two-dimensional data, and let's assume k equals three. So we're going to have three different clusters or groups. The first step is to pick three random data points, which are going to be the center of a cluster, right? So we're going to have three clusters, and each cluster has something called a center, and that's just some other data point, some vector, some two-dimensional coordinate, right? But for all of the other data points, what we need to do is we need to assign them to a cluster, right? Right now, before the algorithm has even started, each data point, we haven't officially assigned it to a cluster. So what we're going to do is we're simply going to assign every data point to the cluster whose center is closest to that data point. But since we picked our initial centers totally randomly, this obviously isn't going to be accurate at first. So let's simply calculate a new center, right? Let's do some averaging. Let's average all the data points that are in a given cluster, because at least by this point, we've assigned data points to some cluster. So let's average all the data points in each cluster, and that'll be the new center. And then simply iterate and start the algorithm over. Now they have a new center, the ones that we just calculated, let's reassign all data points to the closest cluster. And you can keep iterating until the clusters stop changing, or you might set beforehand some maximum number of iterations. Okay, as promised, here's the more detailed review of supervised versus unsupervised learning. So supervised learning is when you learn from a labeled data set. Let's say you have a data set of thousands of people who have used dating apps, and you have x1, x2, x3, which are different inputs that can affect how well they're going to do on these dating apps. So how clever their pickup lines are on a scale of 1 to 10 might be one of those input variables x1, x2, x3. But we also have this label also called a target y. That's the final column. And that's like the average number of matches that this person that corresponds to that row gets per month, right? Their average number of matches per month. And let's say we want to train a model so that when a new person comes along and we have x1, x2, x3, we can predict in advance how many matches they'll get per month. That's the essence of supervised learning. We have this label data we have this y column for a bunch of people but we want to train a model to learn from this data set and predict y for a totally new person and there are some algorithms that can learn without label data those are the unsupervised models an example is clustering which is discussed in this video just check the chapters for the section on clustering and even generative ai models are usually trained with unsupervised learning there's also a section on generative ai in this video so check the chapters for that okay that concludes our explanation of the most common machine learning algorithms. If you're looking for the best projects to build for your portfolio, check out this video and I'll see you soon.